Maundy Thursday comes from the Latin word mandatum, and it is a, uh, a word that uh, recalls the command of Christ when He gave His disciples um, uh, really a heightened level. Uh, he raised the bar on Thursday night. Now, no longer do as it's been done to you, um, or do as you would want it to be done to you. Jesus said in, uh, in this passage here in John 15, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. There's the bar. Total perfection. Absolute perfection in love in every moment of Jesus' ministry with his disciples. As I have loved you, greater love has no one than this, than that someone lay, his, lay down his life for his friends. And uh, when this command came to them, I still think that probably most of the disciples just like not tracking. What is that? What is that? We, I know he said it repeatedly. Three times he said it. But so often they just didn't get what he was talking about until Sunday, which is coming. Sunday. It all began to fall in place. I want to spend some time tonight considering this passage in Matthew 27 and the tearing of the veil. Um, One of the things I love about gathering every year is that we begin to find our way uh, into the passage in such a way, like meditation, as I was talking last Sunday, where you kind of turn the gemstone of this weekend and you begin to see different facets of the events that unfolded. And tonight, One little detail which is massively significant, and yet when you read this passage, there's so many things coming at you that I think it's it's, it's valuable for us to just focus in on this one thing tonight and then ask the Lord to, uh, to cause us to appreciate all the more what we have in our Savior Jesus. So let's pray before we begin. Father, we turn now to your word, and we thank you for this passage. We thank you for uh, Matthew and his uh, detailed account. God, we thank you for the preservation of your word, and we pray as I declare these words tonight that you would land them, do what I can't do, land them in my heart and in our hearts together in a way that would glorify your son Jesus all the more. Cause us to treasure Him. Cause us to rely upon Him even more each day. And Lord, as we walk through this weekend, I pray that it would be precious to us, that these moments would stand out for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, and uh, we pray that you would be honored in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. Okay, now we're tracking along in the day uh, coming tomorrow. So Friday at noon, darkness was all over the land. I'll say more about that in a minute. And that continued for three hours. So from 12 to 3, darkness. And about the ninth hour, probably just before the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Now just stop and consider this. He has been on the cross for almost six hours at this point. Anyone who can say anything in a loud voice is demonstrating a massive amount of resolve and strength. His mind was clear and strong, despite the fact that his body was ebbing out. And so he musters up with willpower and dependence upon the Lord. He speaks these words and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It speaks of the moment when the father turned away his face from the son. The moment of the son's greatest agony. No higher level of pain could have been inflicted than in that very moment when separation occurred. Now, there's mystery here, friends. I don't understand this in its fullness. I don't know that we ever will. The Trinity and oneness and unity and three persons and distinction, right? So, 
In this moment, the father turns his face away from his son, and sin is being judged because God is holy. And as he turns his back on him who knew no sin but but became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, he cries out with a loud voice. Some bystanders were there, and they heard it, and they said, this man is calling Elijah. One of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come and save him. These are mocking words. Even after six hours and all the suffering of Jesus. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. Once again, we reminded this is a resolve of obedience and joy here. He yielded up his spirit. We know the words, John gives us the words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he breathed his last. And behold, okay, whenever you see those words in the scriptures, you've got to know this is a moment here. There's a shock and awe taking place. Behold, Matthew says, just down the hill where the temple was, from where Jesus was crucified. Not in in, in eyesight, because it's inside the temple, but right there where you can see the temple is standing. These events were unfolding. The curtain of the temple. Now, Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, and so he assumes we know what that is, and we're far removed from that. So I'm going to give some explanation about what the curtain of the temple would have been uh, that he's clearly here referring to. The curtain in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. At the same time, the earth shook and the rocks were split and tombs were also opened and, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tomb after his resurrection, they went into the city, into the, the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared to many. <laughs> so you can see why when you're, when you're reading through this in your devotion time, it's like, wow, that, whoa, that. And, you know, you got to slow down and consider some of these moments. This is huge. Hmm. Darkness all over the land. You remember one of the plagues of Egypt when the Lord shut out the light and it was dark, pitch dark. If I had a, a blackout button, we'd do that in here. It's, it's hard to deal with darkness when it's supposed to be light. It's noon. It's the high point of the sun, and it's mid-month, so it's not a solar eclipse. This is supernatural um, symbolism on display. God is shutting out the light for three hours. There's extra canonical sources I came across that refer to this as well. We don't put any authority or stock in those, but it, it's possible that, that eyewitnesses of this saw this experience and, and went through this, not just in Jerusalem, but everywhere that light was supposed to shine in that moment during those three hours on the earth, it's, it's likely that the light was shut out. The work of God. The Father turns His back away. Jesus yields up His Spirit. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own, uh, my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father, John 10, 18. This is, this is Jesus saying, here I come. The work is done. I'm coming to you. He yields up his spirit, and he dies. The curtain is, is torn from top to bottom earthquake. Fascinating little detail here. Matthew skips ahead uh, to talk about these, these saints who were raised. Not every saint, right? But, but saints, some of the saints at least, in these tombs that were split open by the earthquake were, were raised and entered the city on Resurrection Day, Resurrection Sunday. Now imagine how, what that would be like. That would be like coming to Easter and then me bumping into my grandpa and be like, Whoa, man, this day keeps getting better, right? Because who came first? Who was first? Who's the first fruits of the resurrection? Jesus. 
Jesus was resurrected from the grave, and then these bodies were raised, and they entered the city and appeared to many to die again, just like Lazarus, right? Jesus, no, glorified and enthroned forever. So let's get a little detail here on the the curtain in the temple. I think it was fall of 2017, we were in this chapter in the book of Exodus here, and those are all online if you want to go back and listen through that series. Um, Here's the commands to Moses as he is being instructed by God about building the tabernacle. Now, spatial uh, awareness here, the tabernacle would have been probably from here to to the soundboard and about this tall, maybe up to the light bar, a slightly higher Um, The Holy of Holies would have been somewhere around where Mark is to the soundboard, a perfect cube of total holiness as the Lord uh, arranged it. You shall make a veil, this is the curtain, a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine twisted linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. Many uh, commentators believe three cherubim were were in view, uh, woven into uh, the linen. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia, uh, the the wood that was used, and then overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate you from the holy place, uh, shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy or as we know, uh, the holy of holies. Let me show you what this would have looked like here. Oh, I forgot my my laser. Uh, But you can kind of see where we're talking here. Here's the outside where the priest is, and then you go into the tabernacle, and you've got the table of showbread, the menorah, and then the altar of incense that would be burning just outside of the curtain, the veil. Every Jew would know this. The curtain, the veil, well, it's the one that no one can go through except for the high priest once a year. It is where God dwells with his people. It's amazing because this curtain was not only used as a barrier, but it was also used as a covering during transport. No one, I mean no one, not even the high priest as I studied this week, was able to look upon the dwelling place of God, the mercy seat. Even the high priest had to go in with smoke and fill the chamber with smoke before the blood was sprinkled. No eye could see that holiest of holy places. They would wrap the ark in the curtain, the veil. It would be wrapped around it for transport by the poles, as God instructed, and then set up and uh, in such a way that no one would ever look upon the holiest place between the cherubim as their wings reached out over the mercy seat. It speaks to the holiness of our God. He is holy, holy, holy. We live in a day that just fails to esteem this. People who deny the fires of hell have a problem esteeming the reality of the holiness of God. If you understand how holy God is, you will understand why hell is not only hot, but it is forever. He's that holy. Sin is a massive deal, not to our culture, but to the God who is. The holiness of God. It is, as it were, that those cherubim are on that huge veil, that curtain, and they look down as if to say like Gandalf, right? You shall not pass. This is the line. Sinful. Holy. Unworthy. Worthy. Well, what do we do? How do we deal with this? God gave such a gift in the 
the commandments of, of sacrifice and worship. Think every lamb that was slain was a lamb that atoned or covered for sin such that another day could pass where sinners were dwelling in the presence of God who is holy. Apart from that, they would be consumed. The high priest in the Day of Atonement, I just, I, we can't feel how significant this is. Oh, that we could go back and experience this with Israel on the Day of Atonement when they would make sacrifice for the sins of all of Israel and the high priest. And he would go in with a censer of incense and with a, a, a basin of the blood and he would have a rope tied around his ankle because if the Lord rejected the sacrifice and the sprinkling of that blood, he would be struck dead and no one could go get him out. And then what do you do? And so the rope would be released as he makes his way with great care. Think of this man working his way through the veil into the Holy of Holies, with fear and trembling, filling it with smoke from the incense such that he cannot see the, the resting place of the glory of God, and then sprinkling the blood and praying every flinging of his fingers, oh Lord, please accept our sacrifice. Please atone and cover our sins. Again, here we are, sinners. And when he would come out, all of Israel would celebrate, breathe a, a breath of relief. We are not consumed. We have found mercy through the blood of the sacrifice. Now, we have got to feel this. All of this was ordained by God to point to Jesus. That was plan A. All of this experience, every faith-filled sacrifice before the Lord and the, and, the, and the killing of the lamb, and the blood, and all of this. It's all about Jesus. Hmm. Daniel Gertner says it this way, the, the veil then was a physical barrier that represented and enforced the separation from the holy presence of the enthroned Yahweh within and from Aaron and his sons in the holy place just outside. Now, do you remember what Aaron's sons did? Leviticus chapter 10. They brought their incense before the Lord, and, and they brought, it says, strange fire before the presence of God. And what happened to them? They were consumed. They were absolutely struck dead where they stood, and they had to be hauled out. How serious is God about His holiness? You don't just waltz into His presence. Hey, God, I'm your buddy. Let's hang out. Bam! You're dead. We, left to ourselves, have no right and stand no chance with a God of holiness like this. Do you feel that? There is a holy trembling that should grip our hearts when we consider how serious our sin is. We have transgressed God. There are people in the fires of hell right now under the wrath of God. But for His mercy, we're here together. What is our hope? What is our solution? Herod liked to kind of kick things up a, a bit. So you have the tabernacle, and David really wanted to build the temple, and the Lord said, no, you're a man of war. I want to give that assignment to Solomon. And so Solomon was, was blessed with the building of the temple, and then Herod came in and, and, and wanted to kind of trump it up a bit. And so he fixed it up, made it bigger, taller, more fancy, and that was still being worked on in Jesus' day. It's why when Jesus was walking by and he, he saw them working on the temple, he said, you remember what he said? Tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And people thought he was crazy. It's taken all these years to build this. Are you kidding me? 
we read that he was talking about himself. He's the temple. His body. Those are profound words that he said. And I don't think most people there that day understood a thing about what he was talking about. Sixty feet high is what uh, the curtain was in Herod's temple. Some say even up to four inches thick. Now, have you tried to rip fabric before? I was going to put on one of those powerlifting demonstrations, like rip a phone book or something, but I just wasn't feeling like it. So <laughs> I thought I would just describe it. I want you to go home tonight and try to rip your curtains and see how it goes. Kids, please ask your parents. I can see this going really wrong. You, you can't imagine how miraculous this would have been. Tearing a curtain is nearly impossible. Tearing a curtain this significant and woven together and thick is, is impossible. There's no way. But just to, just to make it clear, it was torn from top to bottom. 60 feet up is where it started. And the Lord shredded it all the way to the floor. Blue and purple, scarlet, this was how serious the Lord was in the, um, the skillful making of this fabric. In this day, dye was extremely expensive, partly because you had to smash 12,000 snails to get 1.4 grams of this amazing color to make this fabric, right? Just think of how many snails died for this curtain. <laughs> That's no small amount of work. Why? What does it say? He's holy. This is precious. This is not just from Walmart, right? This is a curtain, the curtain of all curtains. And the cherubim with imposing presence guarding the holy presence of the Lord himself. What is the significance of the curtain tearing from top to bottom upon Jesus' death? Why was it that at 3 p.m., once he had given up his spirit and died, why did it happen then? Three things I would suggest. Number one, this was an unmistakable symbol that the earthly temple in Jerusalem was prophetically judged and would soon expire. 70 A.D. was coming. Jesus was the sacrifice, the once-for-all sacrifice. Every single sacrifice that they attempted after that was purposeless. He accomplished all righteousness. He fulfilled it all, all of the law. It was about Him. And, by the way, the corrupt leaders who were operating this temple... At the moment the veil was torn, would have known exactly what was going on. The temple had served its purpose, and it was done. No more. Number two, it was a supernatural verification that the sacrifice of Jesus was a full and acceptable atonement for sin for all who believe in him. Think of what would have happened. I mean, imagine if you would have been in the temple serving in that moment. All of a sudden, you are in the very presence. You're seeing the ark. You are seeing the mercy seat. You're fearing for your life. You're scared to death. No one's supposed to see that. And it's ripped wide open. What does it mean? It means that there is a way. A way has been provided. The door has been pulled open for sinners like you and me. There's hope for us, friends. There's hope for us with a holy God. No more constant bloodletting, constant sacrificing, constant wondering 
Are we going to be covered? Will he forgive us again this year? No more of that. There's hope. Which leads us to number three. This is a gracious invitation for us to draw near to a holy God by the blood of our Savior Jesus. It's a call to come. Sinners, come. Come and find forgiveness. Provision has been made. The work has been accomplished. It's, it's, it's finished. You can't earn this. You can't be good enough. You can't try to muster it up in yourself. But you can come and put your faith in the one who has done the work. Come and draw near. This is where the book of Hebrews just shines the beautiful light of God's revelation. Listen to the the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, how? How do we do this? By the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain. You see it? It's wide open. That is, through His flesh. Through His flesh. Now, more about that on Sunday. How did he open the curtain through his flesh? We're going to be talking more about that. Why it's so significant. Not only that Jesus died, but that he lived in perfect obedience to God. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Come, come on. We can go. Come together. Let's go to him. We can draw near with heart of, a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. It's true tonight. It was true back then and it's true today. And guess what? We are not holy. We, we, are, we, are, we are sinners. We are rebels. We are those who are worthy of the fires of God's wrath and hell. But a way has been opened, and His name is Jesus. And there is only one way. So our response tonight, just point you to this. We must reckon with the holiness of God. If we don't reckon with this, we will not think enough of the offensiveness of our sin. Do you hate your sin? Does it disturb you? Does it bother you? If not, you need to consider the holiness of God more. When you see how holy He is, you will begin to hate your sin all the more and fight to kill it. And walk with God with confidence, yes, in the promises of God through Jesus Christ, but also with reverence and holy trembling before Him. Obedience, submission, Dependence. Are you trusting in self or are you trusting in Jesus? The world is full of religiosity, lots of action, lots of, lots of calls for this behavior and calls for that behavior. But listen, if it's not connected to Jesus, none of it counts. It's corrupt to the core. This is the parting of the waters of humanity. You're either in your sins, or you're in Christ. You're either trying to be good enough yourself or you're admitting, I know I can't be. I'm not holy. I am a sinner in desperate need of of help and, and salvation. You're trusting in Jesus. would encourage you tonight, don't let this weekend pass. Don't, don't miss what God is doing. He may be stirring right now in your heart. Listen to Him. He may be calling you to address these sins that define your life. You know them, right? You you know what they are. So does He. And it's a big deal. There is forgiveness in Christ. There's hope in Jesus Christ. He saved me. I'm telling you. I know my sin. And He saved me. He forgave me. He can save you. Don't squander this weekend. Make the most of it. Run to Jesus. 
He said this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we delight in your love. We don't deserve it. We are the sinners, the rebels. We are the ones deserving of wrath and the fires of hell. And yet you have shown yourself glorious in bestowing love upon us despite our sin. Thank you for sending your Son. Jesus, thank you for coming with joyful obedience to, to submit your will to the Father and, 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 and walk in obedience and then lay your life down on the cross to pay for our sins. We thank you for the seriousness of atonement and, and the reality of, of forgiveness that has been accomplished through your finished work, Jesus. Thank you that the veil was ripped open and that a way has been made. We thank you that we can come to you anywhere now on this earth. We, wherever we are, we can run to you, the temple. You are the temple. You are the great high priest. You are our hope alone in this life and the next. We delight in you. We, we worship you tonight. And we say thank you. May you receive all glory and praise, O God, our Father, Jesus, our Savior, and Spirit, our joy and comforter. Accomplish your glorious work in our midst this weekend and further your kingdom, we pray, through the proclamation of your gospel in Jesus' name. Amen.